This is going to sound really weird, but both in game and in real life, there can be stars inside of other stars. Hi, we're Ghost Draft, and this is all about Thorn Zhitkov objects. In the game Elite Dangerous, there is a bug where star systems have been generated inside of each other. Case in point, when you go to the galaxy map and set a course for HIP 24020, you'll find... You can't. It's not permit locked, you just can't plot to it. Come on! I can see that you're there! Fine, we'll head to 24019 instead and see if we can get to 20 from there. Alright, we're here. And sure enough, 24020 is only 6 light years away. Let's go! Okay, apparently it's behind the star. And going around isn't helping. Hold on. That isn't 6 light years. It's 6 light seconds. 24020 is inside this star. In astronomy, this is actually a thing. It's called a Thorn Zhitkov object. To help make this video sound a whole lot smarter, we contacted Dr. Emily Levesque who is the first person to discover a star inside another star? Yeah, so I'm Emily Levesque. I'm an astronomy professor at the University of Washington, and I led the team that discovered what we think is the first observational evidence of a thorn Zhitkov object. Now, is it really a star inside of another star, or is it just a merger of two stars? It's kind of both. A thorn Zhitkov object now exists as one star inside another star, because you've got a neutron star inside this big puffy envelope that from the outside looks like a red supergiant. But they formed from mergers. So the way we understand it is that you have two massive stars in a binary system, and one of those stars dies as a supernova, you get this big explosion, and then you're left with a neutron star. The other star in the binary system will then inflate and get big and puffy and cold and become a red supergiant. It'll sort of swallow the neutron star. And that neutron star spirals into the core of the red supergiant. Its presence actually disrupts the fusion currently going on in the red supergiant's core, and it eventually settles at the center of the star in a structure that amazingly is stable and allows the system to continue existing as one star inside another. How did you find this crazy star type? Was it something you were looking for or something that came up in your observations? We found them because we'd been studying red supergiants, which are stars like Betelgeuse. They're very big, puffy, cold, massive stars. They're at least eight times as massive as our sun. And these are the sorts of stars that will eventually die and make things like neutron stars or black holes. We'd been studying normal looking red supergiants and we'd found a couple unusual ones. And a little while after we published a paper on the unusual stars, Anna Zhitkov actually wrote us an email and told us that she and Kip Thorne had invented this idea for a theoretical type of star that should exist, that looks from the outside just like a normal red supergiant but has a neutron star for a core. And based on her email, we decided to do a search four signs that one of the red supergiants we could put into a list might be a thorn Zhitkov object and we were kind of surprised but we managed to find one. You said from the outside it looks like a red supergiant but how do you know there's a neutron star beneath all that? Normal red supergiants have cores that are fusing helium into carbon and their outer layers are basically these big churning layers that stir up elements from deeper in the star and drag them up to the surface. So you'd expect to look at the spectrum of a normal red supergiant where we just sort out the light according to color and you'd see little dips in the light where elements are absorbing light at very specific colors basically. In a thorn Zhitkov object we have something a little different happening because we have a neutron star for a core. And it gives us this very odd chemistry that we really can't explain with any of the normal things that happen inside stars. So you get a lot of excess lithium and um, rubidium and molybdenum, which are all elements that as a set don't come from any one process except the um, process that happens inside a thorn Zhitkov object. So we went looking in the spectra of a bunch of red supergiants for a star that might have way more lithium or way more rubidium or way more molybdenum than is normal. 
So we thought we'd look at about a hundred or so stars and just say, well, normal stars have this much molybdenum and the end. And almost all of the stars in our sample had very similar looking little molybdenum lines and then one had a very strong one. And the same one also had a very strong rubidium line and a very strong lithium line. So what that meant is that there were a lot of those atoms present in the star period and they were most likely made by the processes that happen inside thorn jitkov objects. So it was our sort of clue that we were seeing a star that had a neutron star deep in its core. And what exactly is happening in the core? Because lithium, rubidium, and molybdenum are usually formed out of supernova. How are they being formed inside of a red supergiant? So the very bottom of the outer layers of the thorn jitkov object comes quite close to the surface of the neutron star. And in that part of the star, the conditions are very hot and very high pressure. So if you drag a little bundle of atoms down into that region, those atoms get rapidly bombarded by protons. So if you think about the periodic table, an atom that's sitting in one place on the periodic table will start running up it as it's bombarded by protons. And before it sort of reaches the physical limit, that atom gets dragged back out into the sort of colder, lower pressure layers of the star and starts to decay and sort of work its way back toward a stable state. Before it can make it to a stable state, it's dragged back down into that region and bombarded by protons again. So the name of the process is the interrupted rapid proton process. And from that, you get molybdenum and you get rubidium. The way that we make and destroy lithium inside stars is a bit off balance in a thorn jitkov object, so it's unusually easy for lithium to form and survive in stars like this, again because of those convective envelopes. Normally, if lithium formed, it would then immediately be broken down again. So it means that you wind up building up an excess of lithium in the outer layers of the star as well, and lithium plus the other two elements is a signature that you'd never expect from anything else. Okay, cool. Now, one thing I don't understand is how can an incredibly dense object like a neutron star, like you said, spiral itself inside a red supergiant without ripping it apart? Um, an interesting thing to remember is that neutron stars are dense in part because they're tiny. So a red supergiant, um, if you were to put a red supergiant where our sun is, it would its edge would reach out past the orbit of Jupiter, so they're huge. And a neutron star, by comparison, is about the size of the city of Seattle. So you wind up with this very tiny object spiraling into something that's very massive. And despite the fact that it is so dense and that it's gravitationally spiraling into the core, it could actually make it quite far without ever hitting anything or ever disrupting anything. All right. Yeah, that makes more sense now that I think about that. Now, of course, a neutron star is born out of a supernova. but how could its companion survive? Turns out, binary systems with a neutron star in them aren't impossible. In fact, many known neutron stars have a companion in their system. The reason why is most supernovas aren't symmetrical explosions. The convection and density within a star before it explodes can cause the burst to completely miss its companion. Dr. Levesque, are there a lot of examples of these sorts of systems? Yep. We actually see some really interesting examples of that. So there's a whole class of binary systems in astronomy called high-mass X-ray binaries. And they are binary systems where one star is normal and still alive and fusing usually hydrogen in its core, but sometimes a heavier element like helium. And the other companion is already dead. It's a neutron star, or even better, it's a black hole. So you wind up with these awesome systems where you've got like a black hole dragging material off of a companion, and you, it winds up emitting really bright x-rays because of all the collisions that are happening as that dragging is happening. And we know that systems like that can exist. Um, there's also a version of thorn jitkov object formation where you have a red supergiant and another star, this star explodes and makes a neutron star, and because the supernova is asymmetric, it just kind of goes flying into the center of the red supergiant, like it gets kicked in that direction, which I love because it's the supernova with really awesome aim. There's actually some people too that have studied very recent supernovae, like a supernova that just happened in the last few years, and they've imaged the environment where the supernova happened, and they think they might see signs of a companion to the star that died that survived the supernova. 
that's incredible. But back here on HIP 2420-019, we don't have a supernova remnant. We don't even have a red giant. We have two A stars. They may be pretty big, but they are not Thorn Zhukov objects. They're not even supposed to be inside of each other. They're just bugs. This system has been reported several times, and back in 2016, Commander Stompsalot actually found four other cases. In fact, there are 29 known paired systems in Elite Dangerous. Frontier responded to the reports with, We are aware of issues like this, however, we're unable to change them without destroying the galaxy and starting over, which would be undesirable. Okay, a bit dramatic, but still, how has the Stellar Forge, which generated the game's galaxy, put these systems together? Well, in the case of HIP 2420-019, the systems are actually right next to each other in real life. Here is a picture of 2420, and here is a picture of 2419. If you blinked, you might have missed it. So I can see how the game had a hard time putting them in the right spot. The core of our galaxy is supposed to be a lot denser than it is in game. Extreme star system density was a challenge when the Stellar Forge was first being developed. So to prevent colossal problems, the Stellar Forge generated a slightly less crowded core. But in other parts of the galaxy, known star systems were left as is, and stars that were too close to each other must have been overlapped. But get this, most of these bug systems actually have the right type of stars and are in the right type of places like globular clusters which are where some Thorn Zhipkov objects are theorized to be. Is that right? What's a globular cluster anyway? Globular clusters are very old, so you'd be left with lower mass stars that live much longer, but something like a red giant, which is the sort of star that our sun will turn into. Um, the names are terrible, but red supergiant and red giant are actually two very different things. And in a globular cluster, you could use basically the dynamics of the cluster to fire the neutron star right into the red giant. And we know actually the globular clusters, I mean, they eject runaways that move ridiculously fast. So it's a great way to just basically via, you know, stellar pinball, make things like this that could collide. Yeah. So are there Thorn Zhikov objects we can visit in game? If so, where can we find them? The Thorn Zhikov object that Dr. Levesque found is HV2112. Let's go there now. Just kidding, you can't. It's in another galaxy. The small Magellanic Cloud. There, that one. But for reals, here are some systems we could visit. Uaquari, which in the game is listed as HIP 108876. It's a candidate, but it could also be an Arcor Bor star, which are formed by dwarf star mergers, but we'll cover that in a different video. Uh, this star, also known as that, is a binary star consisting of an evolved F-type primary star and a massive unseen companion. And there's VZ Sagittari, which I couldn't for the life of me find in the galaxy map. Raxla maybe? Nah, just kidding. In any case, Elite Dangerous has created an amazing scale model of the galaxy and within it maybe produced some theorized objects? Who knows? But this isn't the first time a bug has been explained by actual science. Last year, we featured co-orbital moons that were running into each other and the very real-life examples found in our own solar system. There are some more real-life examples of bugs in game and those videos will be coming in future episodes. Speaking of future work, our guest Dr. Levesque has a really cool book coming out next year. Yeah, so I'm writing a book called The Last Stargazers that's actually going to be published in August of 2020. And the whole book is about what it's like to be a professional astronomer and work at telescopes. It goes through some of the really wild stories and adventures that astronomers have had, like really going out to the edges of the planet and into the stratosphere and really to these wild extremes in order to just get a telescope into the right place or get to a telescope and try to answer a question they have about the universe. Thank you so much for helping us out today, Dr. Levesque. And thank you all for watching. We've been Ghost Giraffe. Now we got it. I got it. How do you... Which button is it? Is this one right here? Yeah? But, okay. Bye. Push your button.